Thanks, Erin. Yeah, um, as a mother, I always going through this. Then I thought, how we balance? It's always I had the question, and how we navigate. Then I thought that will be useful for all the other mothers who want to be mothers or be mothers. So, I invited MS in five speakers today, and I'm um, first of all I want to thank you all and accepting that and agree. Given your time, I know how busy how how's the struggle so first i'll invite bell senior market development manager in sykes um, and she's based in usa bell because you are, you have a youngest baby <laughs> i thought you, you'll get the first chance please go ahead and share your story with us thank you um to see do you see my screen yes yes Bell. okay yeah. fantastic okay hopefully you can hear me really well as well <clears throat> Um, so, yes. yeah, first of all, thank you so much, Femmes, um, again, for having me this month um, for the happy hour. And I am really passionate to talk about this subject um, because I've uh, uh, recently uh, just had my second baby. Um, I'm actually on maternity leave right now. So um, what I wanted to do was just really sort of um, present some of the challenges that are um, really more personal to me um, and also how I overcame some of those barriers and and how maybe you know you might be able to apply those too but a very quick brief overview about myself um, some of you might have heard me talk at one of the last FEMS meetings but my name is Bao um, I am British by birth um, however my parents originate from India um, I lived and worked all across uh, Europe and I moved to the United States uh, in 2014 and I'm now a green card holder um, I'm involved in a lot of community-based um, activities, such as uh, the Metabolomics Society Board of Directors. I serve there as treasurer, um, and I'm a member of the working group, uh, Metabolomics Working Group for the ABRF, which is uh, mainly a proteomics um, stroke genomics-based um, type of community, but the more they start to do multi-omics work, the more they explore metabolomics. And then I'm part of the community-driven effort um, MQAC, uh, which allows to apply best practices of QAQC, um, and, and I'm um, um, leading a manuscript with the reference testing materials working group, that's a subgroup of MQAC. Um, I've been serving as a, a mentor to mothers who return back to work, and I'll speak about that briefly, um, about um, uh, an initiative that, that I helped set up at SciEx. And I'm currently living in Colorado, um, so I'm here in my dark basement because it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit upstairs in the house. So hopefully um, you can see me and hear me well. Um, and we live here um, with my husband and our three-year-old son. And as Tussie was just saying, I've just had um, a little daughter. She's 12 weeks old and she's in the bottom there. And um, as I said, I've got a week and a half or a week and one day left of maternity leave. Um, and we love being here. So just a little bit about my work experience. Um, I've got 20 years experience in the life sciences industry. It's spanned across the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm currently working for a mass spectrometry vendor um, or a company called SciEx, and it's part of Danaher, um, Danaher Corporation. Um, and I started out life at uh, the bench as a scientist, but I moved into business um, strategy and product management type roles. And now I'm in the commercial part of the organization leading life sciences market. And over the course of the last 10 years, it's actually allowed me to broaden my expertise um, in the field of marketing. So my, my roles have been both global um, for about seven years, um, meaning a lot of international business travel, um, but more recently over the last three to four years, uh, more regionally based roles. Um, and my responsibilities are for North America, Canada, and Latin America. So um, Tusi asked us to present what um, my, our career goals were. So just a very high level overview and then to talk about some of the challenges that I've experienced along the way um, in, in my career to date. So really my career goals, I've never had like a very specific goal, but as a scientist, I think we can all relate to the fact that we really wanna be the best at what we do, right? We wanna advance the research. We want to impact human health. We want to impact the scientific field as best as we can. So for me, it was always to get to the top of my scientific game. Um, and then when I sort of reached that sort of um, 
that, that, that point, then I started to look um, at my peers and my colleagues um, and to senior leaders in the organization and really wanted to make the move to business and strategy and really to drive the vision of products within the organization. I wanted to gain commercial expertise um, as well as driving the execution of the strategy. Um, and then um, I'll talk a little bit about my treasurer role um, at the Metabolomic Society, but that was really to gain deeper understanding of finance. Um, and so being responsible for the, for the P&L, the profit and loss of the society really gives me that, that um, um, experience. Uh, ultimately, I think bigger picture for me, for my career, I'd love to lead a marketing organization one day and really create, um, continue to create impact in the scientific field. So some of the challenges and opportunities that I've faced along the way, um, I've broken down into, I think eight bullets. Um, and I'm gonna cover those over the next sort of uh, five minutes or so. One is really around job responsibilities. When I became a mother for the first time in 2018, um, and even backtracking from that, I fell pregnant when in 2017, I had a role that was a globally based role. Um, I did quite a bit of international business travel. I would travel maybe every other month to a different country in the world. Um, that was really, really great. Um, and I loved um, doing um, business, doing science in many different cultures. However, um, what that meant was that when I became pregnant and then I had my, my, my son, um, I really wanted to be around with my family more. And that really meant that I had to start looking at my role. Um, so I negotiated um, a, a remote based role um, away from my office based role, um, meaning that I had more flexibility with my working hours. And I actually negotiated a regional based role, meaning I could stay just in in the Americas, as we call it. So looking after the, the North America, Canada and Latin America businesses, um, meaning minimal business travel. And if I did go, it would be for maybe um, a couple of days at a time um, uh, every so often and not being away from home for so, so long. It also led me to have a really better work-life balance and my efficiency in terms of my delivery of my work actually accelerated knowing that I would start at a certain time, finish at a certain time because I wanted to spend the evenings with my family meant that I was much more efficient um, at delivering work. Um, so in that way, I actually progressed and excelled um, um, within my job. It's a small bullet, but it's a big thing. Um, the second one is around implicit bias. So implicit bias is, is a way of being biased to somebody where you, where you almost don't even know that you're doing it. Um, and I think, so the way that this affected me was just an assumption in general, whether it was work or, or any other type of scenario was that I now have a child and suddenly that means that I don't have bandwidth or there's um, some sensitivity around offering opportunities to me. Um, and so the way that I overcame that was really to be very open about opportunities, um, to really say upfront that you don't need to worry about the fact that, you know, I can make those decisions for myself and I don't need somebody to make those decisions for me. And so I really um, became much more confident and, and vocalized my ambition um, having children doesn't mean that you, you, you should lack any ambition at all. Um, a major another barrier um, being in the United States and being English, of course, is that maternity leave actually varies by state by state. And if you're from the UK, you do get maternity leave up to one year. Um, and, and it also applies to Canada. Um, however, with my first child, I, I took eight weeks leave because I was based in California. Um, it was really tough because... At the time, I um, was not expecting um, surgery. I had an emergency C-section and that meant major abdominal surgery. And so, you know, being out on leave, but also overcoming surgery and recovering, um, it was a very short amount of time. So when I became pregnant with my second child, um, I look back and in hindsight, I wish I'd stayed at home a little bit longer, not only to recover, but also to spend more time um, uh, with, uh, with my second child. And so this time around, I've taken 12 weeks leave and I'm in Colorado, so it allows for that. Um, but really um, the other way of overcoming that barrier, those short sort of uh, leave periods were to transition out my projects early and actually 
you know, I am always on the go at 100 miles an hour that sitting down and not doing anything um, actually is hard work for me. So I really, this time around, um, took time for rest and recovery and didn't take it too hard on myself that I, that I wasn't doing anything because that's really, really important to, to get back up to speed um, if you do want to go back to work full time or even part time. Um, another major barrier was really sort of nursing and nursing facilities. So there was a lack of dedicated nursing facilities when I did go back to work. Um, and so I did bring this up um, to our leadership team. And we initiated um, mother's rooms across, not just our North America offices, but really rolled them out across um, SIEX. And um, uh, in actual fact, um, we're looking at, you know, how the state um, is across the other operating companies within, within Danaher. Um, I mentioned that I moved from a global base role to a, to a regional base role, and that meant you know, um, how was I gonna, I was breastfeeding my, 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 both my children actually now. And so how do I continue to do that while I'm traveling? So, you know, there's the subject of pumping or well, you're pumping milk. Then if you're in Canada, how do you get that milk back home? So at the time, um, I spoke with our HR team and they actually ended up offering to female associates that were traveling away from home for business um, uh, a, uh, an organization called Milk Stalk that allows you to essentially ship you a FedEx box. You pump the milk, you put it in an igloo, it's got dry ice in there and they ship it um, home. So that meant that I could keep on top of, you know, my, my mothering duties while I was away from, ho from home. That also allowed me to feel much more um, um, confident with my job because in the beginning, it can really make you feel very guilty that, that you feel like you're traveling and away from, from your child. And just to sort of finish up here, um, some of the other challenges um, that I, I experienced were around sort of the support system, both at home and at work. So at work, there was really not a support structure in place to support not only um, women coming back from maternity leave, but women who got pregnant and not just women, we've now taken that a bigger look at that and it's just parents in general. Um, so you're a first time parent, second time or however many times, but really there was no way to <clears throat> follow the person as they were going out on leave and then sort of integrating them back into the workplace. And so I um, feel really proud that with um, a couple of other women um, at SIEX, I actually initiated and rolled out the first men mother's mentorship program um, in, in North America. And now that's actually been picked up. And so the best practices were shared and that is gonna be rolled out across um, our sites um, globally and potentially even Danaher because it's part of a, um, a high level initiative at SIEX right now called PD, uh, which is policy deployment. Um, and so they're looking at ways that they can really um, um, up the game in uh, diversity and inclusion. And one of my other colleagues set up coffee chats bi-weekly, so that meant that I could go and anybody could go that, that was in a similar situation and really talk about, they could laugh, they could cry, just have a shoulder to, to chat with and, and just be themselves and, and talk about any challenges they might be having. Um, the home support was a really big factor, even though it's one bullet on this, on this screen. Um, we, uh, we, meaning me and my husband, moved from Europe. Um, we have no family in the United States and we had very limited sort of friends network circle. But really, we had no one to depend on in terms of childcare. Um, so daycares are um, really, really um, in high demand in the Bay Area. And it can sometimes mean a, um, a 12 to 24 month wait list, which we weren't prepared for. And so uh, I also we also had to look at the fact that I actually had some travel involved in my job and how we would handle that, um, even from a regional perspective. Um, and so for us, we really were dependent on some flexibility in the schedule. And we were fortunate enough that we had a home that allowed um, for flexibility to actually employ an au pair. So for the first year um, of having my son, um, we did uh, employ an au pair that lived with us and allowed me that flexibility to get back to work. And then after that one year, we sort of established a routine and we got our um, son into daycare. And so we could take it from there. Um, lastly, <clears throat> the personal support system, right? I've gone from being um, one um, in a group of friends 
um, that had a, had a young child, a newborn. And so it was really hard to have a local sort of network of friends that, that were in a similar situation. So um, I actually joined a, a local breastfeeding support group that was at the hospital, both the first time round and the second time round. And then um, I also joined Facebook Mums Group, um, both in the San Francisco Bay Area um, and now in Denver. And so these are just ways that I've just kept on top of um, being, um, uh, making sure that, that I have a network that I can reach out to. And, you know, when I run into challenges or maybe share, you know, some things that I have with, with new mums. And just to finish, just to say, like, you can aim high, you can be who you want to be. It doesn't matter if you have children or not. Um, you just need to make the appropriate adjustments, know your limits um, and, and just be open with yourself. Don't overcommit um, because it can be challenging. Um, and even though I've recognized that I do run at 100 miles an hour, sometimes I do have to step back um, and, and really sort of, you know, decline opportunities um, because of that work life balance. Um, learn to ask, right? Ask your manager for flexibility and ask for those opportunities because if you don't ask you don't know um you 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 might not get them or you know what's the worst that can happen the answer might be no but i it never has been and you can work around it and lastly enjoy the family time time flies really really quickly um they grow up super fast and um with that i'll i'll finish there thank you so much Val. that's so interesting to hear um, I think most of mothers going through and so brave um, to take that challenges and facing and balancing. Um, amazing. Um, is any any question from the uh, audience want to ask? Uh, I don't see any in the chat. Um, yeah, hi. Um, if there's time, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just Go wanted to it. say, I seem to have two Zooms. Um, Belle was a senior PhD student oh, in the same group. Hi, <laughs> I didn't know that was you. <laughs> I just wanted to say it's wonderful to hear your story and I'm really happy for you and congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's really good to see you. Well, um, I have I have one question. Uh, what your recommendation for supporting mothers in future, or do you think it's it's not limited to US because from this side we have lots of things to do, and is there any recommendation we come up with some global uh, support? Uh, yeah, I mean, so we had to start somewhere, right? We had to start small and and see what works. So we did a sort of try storming session and we, I ended up mentoring three mothers and there were two of us that were mentoring at the time. Um, and we learned what worked and what didn't work. And um, given that this has now become a, a higher level initiative in the, in the company, um, we had the ability to share those best practices um, with um, a larger group of people that are now actually rolling that out across um, the rest of, um, of SIEX, but also taking it a level up and saying, okay, well, what about some of the other operating companies? So, so Dana actually uh, um, is part of, um, actually owns um, Leica, if you've heard of Leica Microsystems, um, Beckman Coulter, and, and a bunch of other um, operating companies. So it actually forced them to take a look at, well, you know, if this is happening at one operating company, you know, we, we should really standardize this across the board and that's what they're good at. So there is a plan, we've built the process out, we identified where all the gaps were, and now we're working on, and, and that happened just before I went out on leave. So I believe the team has been making amazing progress, but I don't have any visibility to it. Um, I will do when I get back, but I know that um, given it's a high level initiative, um, like I said, it's, it's um, um, a process that's really pushed by the president of the company. Um, I'm pretty confident that, that um, we're pretty far along in the, in the way to implement it across the organization. Thank you so much, Val. Because of the timing, we'll move to sure. Amanda. Yeah, thank you so much. Amanda, your turn. Um, so next speaker, it's Amanda around or? <laughs> Amanda, um, you are the PhD candidate from the University of New Carolina. 
and would love to hear while you are studying, having a baby. Um, so. And Tusi, I don't think she's on right now. So we might have okay. to skip to the, to the next person. Yeah. Hopefully she can okay, join us we, by the end. Yes, that's what I like. I can't see her and it's okay. Um, Sarah, um, I'm so happy to have you in the presentation. I know we went through from a very long time. To, I've seen you a student and then growing as a research fellow and as a mother now. And uh, Sarah is from location in the UNSW, University of New South Wales, Sydney, um, as a, a research fellow and love to hear your, your talk. Uh, Sarah, to you. Great, thank you for inviting me to speak today, Tusi, and for that lovely introduction. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. So as Tusi said, I'm Sarah. I'm from University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, where I'm currently working as a research fellow. So just to start a little bit of background about me. Um, so I have lived the entirety of my life in here in Australia and have gone through uh, from undergrad through to PhD through to postdoc um, at a couple of different Australian institutions. Used to be based at the University of Wollongong, so that's where I did my PhD and my very first postdoc. And the work that I did there was really on lipids and lipidomics. So my PhD work looked at um, how lipids change within the brain during normal aging. I then did a couple of years postdoc, um, uh, and in that I was really starting to get to grips with more advanced mass spectrometry techniques, uh, trying to use mass spectrometry in a way that overcomes some of the challenges that it has in lipid profiling. And then uh, in 2017, I moved to where I am now, UNSW Sydney, and I've broadened my horizons here. I'm starting to work a lot more on metabolomics, studying things such as pancreatic cancer, cell metabolism, aging, obesity, and most recently developing methods for single cell um, metabolomics. In addition to this, um, also currently serving as the secretary for the Australian New Zealand Society for Mass Spectrometry, and most recently joined the Australian New Zealand Society, sorry, Metabolomics Society as an early career member. And then last year in July, I gave birth to my daughter, uh, Margaret Ann, shown here. Um, some photos pretty early on in her life and some more recent down the bottom. Um, and so my daughter, Margaret, was born at the height of the COVID pandemic here in Australia, which was a very interesting and very challenging time to be pregnant and a new mum. Let's just leave it at that, I think. <laughs> So I also wanted to give a little bit of background of what it's like to be an academic here in Australia and a, a mother or parent academic, um, simply because we have it pretty good here. Um, we have a lot of benefits that perhaps not apparent in other countries, particularly after listening to Val's talk, she might be a little bit jealous of some of the perks that we have here in Australia. And I'm sure it's pretty similar back in the UK as well. Um, so, yeah, as an academic, uh, we're entitled to parental leave, and that's either parent, the, the mother or the father, six months at full pay or up to 12 months at half pay, uh, which is quite generous. Um, and that is covered by the university. So, for example, my salary is paid out of project grant funding, um, but the university actually covered my maternity leave. So that burden was borne by my supervisor having to pay for my salary. Uh, which I think is really great. Uh, it sort of it benefits both the parent taking the leave as well as uh, the person funding that person's salary. Um, and then when you return to work, um, there's a lot of uh, various schemes that you can apply for. Uh, for example, I'm in the process of applying for what's known as a career advancement fund, which is $10,000 given to, to women when they come back from maternity leave. And that's to assist with getting their labs back up and running and their research back up and running. So, um, you know, I can spend that either on buying consumables, things for research, or I can hire a research assistant to come in and help boost my productivity. So very generous indeed. Uh, we also have great schemes, most universities here, um, you know, to make it more easier to transition back into work. So we have workshops, we have, you know, coaching, mentoring schemes, things that we can apply for. And the facilities that we have here, for example, um, I'll talk a lot about, uh, how difficult it was to get nursing rooms and a nursing program going at, at SIAX and SIAX um, sister companies 
Here we have nursing rooms that we can access. Our, our time to those is unlimited, basically. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's really quite great. So just to also uh, let you guys know what it's like for students, if you're a PhD student here in Australia, um, and you're covered under um, a national scholarship such as the AGRTP, which is the Australian Government Research Training Program, or a university-based university postgraduate award, you're entitled to up to 12 weeks paid scholarship leave, and you can take up to 12 months unpaid program leave from your course. We also have access to a governmental paid parental leave scheme that's income tested, so you have to be earning under a certain amount to access that, which thankfully I was. So we, we can receive up to 18 weeks worth of maternity leave pay from the government. Um, and we can also transfer that to the other parent if we want to. So I ended up taking just over six months full pay leave from my university, and then I transferred my paid parental leave to my husband, so he's been on leave. The last few months with our daughter. Um, and most of the major grant schemes that we apply for for research funding here in Australia allow for career interruptions. So you actually can describe that in your application if you take time out of research to be involved in not only child raising but also other care activities. Um, and you can you can claim that leave back in that if you are you know applying for a scheme that has an eligibility period post PhD. Um, you can extend that out by however much time you've taken out of academia. So, yeah, as, I, as I've said a few times, really quite fortunate to be here working in Australia. Where there are a lot of things that we get access to. However, there is still some room for improvement. All right, so these, I'm just going to talk through some of the points um, that we were asked to discuss. Um, and I've just put them on the screen so I don't go off rambling on a bit of a tangent. <laughs> Um, so my career goals uh, have been to work in academia as a researcher. Eventually, I would like to lead my own group, and I would also like to be in a position where I'm able to teach. Um, so moving into, I guess, what you would call the North American system of tenure track position, if that is possible. Um, how it has changed. Um, so. My career goals are still the same. Uh, they haven't really changed. Um, the COVID pandemic actually has had a bit more of an impact on that simply because we've, we've had some issues with funding here in Australia, which makes career progression a little bit challenging at the moment, but hopefully in the coming years that will resolve itself. Um, you know, I mean, the biggest change I think for me is uh, my priorities have shifted quite a bit. Obviously, you know, I used to work quite long hours, particularly as postdoc um, and weekends, and I really can't do that anymore, nor do I really want to do that anymore. You know, I really want to spend the time that I am at home with my family, with my husband and with our daughter. Um, and so I've had to, to dial back a little bit on that. Um, this means that, you know, I've had to uh, start to rely on other people a lot more and say no to things. Um, when I'm overextended. So I used to be very hands-on with the students that I currently have in the lab. I um, spent a lot of time with them working side by side, coaching them, mentoring them and everything else. I've had to give up a little bit of the responsibility of that and trust the students a little bit more in the lab, let them go ahead and make their own mistakes um, and fail um, rather than hand-holding them as much as I used to, simply because I, I need to focus my time you know, on the work that I need to get done. So I think that's been both good for me and good for the students. Most of the students in my current lab are near the end of their PhD, so it's time that they, they get a little bit more independent anyway. So what has worked for me? Um, there's a lot of things I think that, that I've been blessed with uh, coming back to work after having my daughter. You know, I have a partner or a husband who is very much invested in being an equal parent. So he's actually taken, well, he will take six months paternity leave himself um, to be at home with our daughter. So that's made it a lot easier for me to transition back into work, knowing that he's at home looking after and taking really good care of her. Um, I have a very supportive boss. Um, I've got a bit that's probably one of the bigger things that's really eased me back into work, in addition to my husband being so great, is, uh, you know, my, my boss, um, he is himself very much invested in his family. and. You know, he will um, dial back on his own work responsibilities when he needs to, to, to be with his family and to take equal partnership in his own home life. 
um, which is not something that I see modeled by a lot of male PIs. Um, and he is very open and transparent about it and, and vocal too uh, within our school and our faculty. So that's been really great to see him uh, demonstrate those values and, and really lead that um, from his position. Um, time management, I touched on this a little bit in the last, last um, point, but yeah, I, you know, being a parent, having limited time at work has meant that I've really had to get very good at time management. Um, I really thought that I was good at it, but turns out there's always room to improve. Um, so yeah, um, just trying to make sure you know, when I'm at work, I'm working hard. When I'm at home, I'm, I'm really present and spending time with my family. And so lastly, what would the recommendations and advice be to be to, to provide more support? So, you know, I think um, working in the Australian system, we have a lot of support. And I think that in other countries, this is something that really needs to be taken on <laughs> uh, to provide support for, for mothers and, and fathers to, um, you know, taking parental leave. Um, but I think, you know, uh, that sort of progress wasn't one overnight, right? It was really a big shift in the, um, the values and the uh, thinking, I guess, of people more higher up than me at the universities. And so I really think it is on uh, people in positions of power at particular institutions to, to lead that change um, and to drive it. You know, I, as I mentioned, I've got a very supportive class. I have a lot of great mentors um, that are parents themselves, um, and they are very vocal within our school and our institution. At, at, at you know um, cultural change and trying to, to make things easier for parents and trying to smooth the way a little bit more. So I think you know if you are on this call and you are you know in such a position, you know you, you should be trying to use your voice where possible, trying to um, you know uh, get support for things such as equity scholarships, extended maternity leave, and so forth. You know I mean we've seen I think a lot of change in science, particularly within the last ten to fifteen years. Work life balance it seems to be getting better across the board, but if we want to see um, more change, we really have to be very vocal and, and uh, try to institute that. And so that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's really great to hear um, how you balance and uh, you have a great support. Uh, is there anyone in the audience want to ask Few questions before moving to Catherine. Um. So I guess I have a quick one for you, Sarah. So you said that um, having a boss that's some supportive is really important. What would you have done if your boss wasn't supportive? Because I know some people run into that. Yeah, I mean, I was very strategic when I moved into this position and chose a boss that I knew would be supportive. Given my uh, age and my life stage, I knew that having a child was on the cards in the coming years. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I knew my boss before I joined and chose him for that reason. I think, you know, if, if you don't have a supportive PI um, or a supportive boss, I honestly don't know what you would do. Um, I, I, I guess finding a good network, um, finding other mentors outside of, of where you're currently at, to help support you and to help even just give you the pep talk you need to go and speak to your boss to try and uh, to, to, you know, to get flexible working conditions or whatever else that you need to get your work done. Um, but, but really, I think, you know, uh, this sort of thing comes from a, from a cultural shift and, and the joining of many voices to try and drive the change. Um, You yeah, know, I think that's great yeah. advice. That's a, it's such a hard one. I've I've heard from a lot of women that have had unsupportive situations. So I just I was curious what you would say. Yeah, I've been very blessed to not to not be in that position. Um, you know, and I, and I really my heart goes out to anybody who is currently in that position. I can only imagine how difficult my life would be without having a great PI um, and a great husband. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. So we'll move to, because of the time, and allowed to continue talking to everyone. So, but uh, next speaker, Catherine Vaughan. Catherine, um, from, a professor from Peking University. Catherine, thank you so much for accepting and uh, love to hear from your 
side, uh, how you navigate your career with the motherhood to you? Can you see my screen? Yes. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I. Uh, it's very early. <laughs> so in the morning in China, and I supposed to send my kids to school. So because of this meeting, I have to rearrange that. <laughs> and um, so actually I, I, I was born in Shanghai and then I immigrated to Hong Kong with my parents uh, when I was in a teenage. And then I got my PhD um, in the University of Hong Kong, um, studied the fundamental mass spectrometry. And after that in um, 2005, I, I went to Scripps and into John Ye's group. And I spent eight years there as John's uh, visiting scientist and his postdoc and his senior staff scientist until 2013, I got um, recruited back to China for some reason to build a center called National Center for Protein Science in Shanghai. That's um, in charge by the Academy of uh, Science in China. And then, um, um, I was the assistant director there and also in charge of the whole mass um, the, 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 the system, the platform. And then in 2017, I uh, moved to Peking University, the medical school and built another center <laughs> so called Precision Medicine Multi-Omics Research. And so um, in, the, in the second, I mean, in the last year, I mean, the year before last in, in Ye's lab, I um, become a mother, I got a child, and so he's eight years, um, I think eight and a half years old now. So I'm now the, I'm very busy at work. You can see I'm the director of the center. And also I'm the PI of the, the Peking University, Peking Tsinghua University Center for Life Science. And also the, um, uh, the honorary professor for the University of Manchester. So my major work is um, in academia as a professor. So. Uh, my goal of my career, actually, I don't have a particular goal set by myself. Usually it's the life, I mean, the fate bring me to whatever they need. So um, start from the technology itself as a fundamental mass spec people, then in Ye's lab, I learned how, did, how the proteomic works to, um, to serve or to solve all the biological questions. And now we will move to the best side. So the center I built in Beijing, oh, this is the Shanghai center I built when I came back to China. And up to now, I um, already published more than 80 papers in uh, you know, top journals. And so two years ago, I mean, three years ago, um, when I built this Center for Precision Medicine, I think that's the mainly my goal because I want to demonstrate how to use MassBet to, to um, really do the precision medicine. It's a new approach for future medicine I call. So in the center, we, uh, we de develop the cutting edge technology and we discovered the biomarker and also we do translational research. And so this is the whole center and we published um, just actually last year, we had a paper accepted in the nature chemical, uh, nature cell biology. And so we developed the state of the art um, single cell proteomic technique and um, that's by far the best method in the world. And also we work a lot of on the COVID-19 project since the, the pandemic um, last year. And so I think the challenge for my career is because I, I got my education all in the Western cultural country. And then after I moved back to China, um, I think eight years ago, so the, there's a lot of a uh, different system of culture and the value, et cetera. So I get a culture shot very much. And also I need to constantly do my adjustment balance, you know, alternatives for, for the career to move smoothly. And I think these are the, my um, unique um, issue for my career type. And also be a parenthood. I, I think it's, um, I don't know how to say, I think that to be half a children, the children is the most unpredictable and irreversible project to me. And I have no reference to quote 
because because my son is a boy and, and I'm a girl and I'm a woman, so I can't even call to my own, you know, when I was young, how I looked like. So it's totally different. And uh, the, the major concern for me is um, I have no time for myself because I, um, bef before my kids, I, ha I have a tons of time, you know, I, I, I can go to, go to sports, I can go to beauty and uh, whatever else. But now <laughs> I, I have, I sacrifice my own time for him. I, I think that's the trade-off. And so, but um, I think the, my recommendation for, for all the young girl or whatever girls or women, um, I think I'm quite special. I don't really separate career and motherhood as two things. Um, I see them the same because they are all my, my life part of my life. So I, maybe I treat my son as one of my most important projects. So um, for example, um, if you have a different PhD student in your group, right? So sometimes this one has a high priority because they have some problem need to solve. And this one has, you know, next time he has some problem, some priority need to be solved, some problem. So my kids also like that. Uh, once I need to take care of him, whatever, for his life or his study, I just put all my concentrate on him. And then later on when he's settled then I can move to some of my work. Um, it's just, just your life. I, I, I don't know how I explain that clearly, but I just don't separate, this is your job, this is your uh, family thing. Um, I think they're same to me. Maybe I'm a professor as a career. So research work um, is part of my life. So um, well, after you get out, you brush your teeth and then you start to work either on your son or on your research project. <laughs> so um, I just sacrifice most of my um, leisure time. So that's the, that's the thing. And also, um, one thing is very important, just don't be shy and really ask for help around you. For example, sometimes I need to go travel uh, to give talks or, or whatever meetings in different city. And um, in my home, I have, uh, so I, I, I don't, I, I'm a single parent and I only have a, a living house uh, Nanny, and but it's very good that she's really helpful, and I always joke and say, "Oh, you are like my wife, and I'm the husband who go out to earn <laughs> your life, and she's like my household wife or something." But um, sometimes when she's not, uh, she's at her home, so I need to ask some relatives help, or even I pay my students say, "Oh, do you like to do some babysitting work?" and just something like that. And also, you have to treat train your child being very um, independent. I mean, um, when he was like two year or maybe even younger, I already not seen him as a baby. So I already <laughs> see him like a adult. <laughs> and I always tell him, say, hey, mommy need to work. Sometimes he say, oh, mommy don't go out for work and play with me. Then I would say, um, okay, mommy have a, another time to play with you when I, I with your project, <laughs> your turn. But now it's mommy need to work. And then I told him, say, uh, well, when you grow up, you may be more busier. You're even busier than, than your mom now. <laughs> you better get used to it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, he, he, well, he actually adapted pretty well. And we have very good bonding connection, always kissing, you know, very um, intimate. But also he quite understand uh, my job. And so um, I have, um, I have, so I, I don't know what to say, just um, having babies is really fun. And just like you have the coolest uh, project. So this is, I just show some picture. And uh, <laughs> so he's, sometimes he, he even now is a year old, but sometimes he thinks he's older than me. And cause uh, he thought I'm more childish than him. <laughs> <laughs> and so I will, so uh, he like to play go and he, I, I sometimes take him to my lab and doing those, um, put those uh, pipettes into the box and looking at the, the, the microscope for some cell, living cell. Uh, unfortunately, he doesn't really like mass <laughs> He said, that's ugly. 
and <laughs> so sad. And um, so uh, he's now in the, uh, the international school and he likes to play drum and basketball and fencing. And now he really thinks he's older <laughs> than me. <laughs> and so it's so cute that in the Mother's Day, and um, I was um, actually in the very 10 days long trip, but he's, uh, of course we, 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 we FaceTime every, every day and whatever I have time, I even check on his homework. And then he wrote a letter to me. So during my trip and he know I'm going to tackle those uh, COVID-19 virus, that's very evil thing. And then he say, oh, um, oh, but when I come back home, it's a children's day. So I don't forget to get him a gift for the children's day. <laughs> And so, <laughs> and the last year, oh no, I mean, yesterday, two days ago, two days ago, I really happy that two of my students got a scholarship and at the same time, he got a school award. Um, so basically, I think you don't need to too, too much take it like a very heavy things in your life because having baby, they are all different and you always have your way to deal with your project. And so Charles' children, they are a gift from God and motherhood and career, they are very fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much, yeah. Catherine, my, to hear that talk. Great, great talk and presentation, like having fun with the baby. Yes, uh, that's, um, it's rewarding. It's very rewarding, yes. Uh, um, because of the um, timing, um, can we move to uh, Kerry? Um, Kerry, uh, next speaker. Um, Kerry uh, is uh, director of uh, MREC University of Florida. Kerry, take away, please, uh, because we're running out of time. <laughs> Hello, can you see my screen? Perfect. All right, oops. Okay, so um, this is my abbreviated CV. Uh, I will try and keep us on time. Um, I got my bachelor's in 1994, and in 1999, I got my PhD. And then from 1999 to 2014, I was the director of the mass spectrometry and proteomics facility at Ohio State University and the adjunct associate professor in molecular and cellular biology. In 2014, I uh, moved to University of Florida, where now I am the director of the Mass Spectrometry Research and Education Center. And here you can see my lovely group. And along with my work CV, I wanted to uh, describe my motherhood CV and that in 1997, my first child was born and I was a third year graduate student in my PhD program. In 2000, my second child was born. And if you note, I started my career at Ohio State in 1999. So I had him just exactly one year after starting at Ohio State. Um, and then in 2008, while I was well established at Ohio State, I had my third child. And in 2013, I uh, had a new marriage and uh, um, took in uh, my, my stepson. So I have four children. And I have children from when I was in graduate school, from when I was early in my career, and then what I consider later in my career. So I hope to provide some insight as to having children at different stages of their career. And so down here is a picture of me when I was getting my PhD with my son, who at the time was two years old. And anecdotally, when I went and gave my exam, it turned out that I had oatmeal on my suit from feeding him breakfast that day. <laughs> So uh, career goals and challenges is something that we were asked to talk about. And this picture to me sums it up perfectly. These are my career goals. I have all my books of learning and science, what I love, but I have to take my child to work because school is closed because of one reason or another, and I still need to get my job done. So he brings his toys. He steals my little um, lab rat that I have as a little toy and his action figures attack it. <laughs> Um, but in all seriousness, uh, when I was a younger person, um, being a mother was my number one desire before, while I was, before I even had children, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And so I feel like I spent 
um, time thinking about what career I could have that would fit that goal, because I had an idea of what kind of mother I wanted to be. And so I wanted to make sure that I picked something that had flexibility, um, tolerable tra travel, you know, I, I, I still like to, uh, to learn and go to meetings and stuff like that, and, and things like lab safety, I didn't want to work in a lab that had like a lot of toxic chemicals and things like that. And so mass spec was a good fit. And where I have landed in my career as being a director of a, of a core lab has been a really good fit as far as things like fix the flexibility, some travel, but not uh, excessive travel. And so I'm going to kind of describe in my uh, discussion, the having children early and mid and late career. So I have some pros and cons for all of them. Um, so when I was a student and I had my son, um, the very much con was that I basically had no maternity leave. Um, it was at my time, it really was non-existent. And I had a compassionate PI that gave me some time without making me take a leave of absence. I didn't want to take a leave of absence from my school. And then also sometimes when you're really early in your career, you're financially limited. If you don't have paid maternity leave, you might not be able to take very much time off because you have bills to pay. When I was a student and I had my son, I had a very flexible work schedule. If he was sick, I didn't have to um, reschedule my whole day because it was basically my research that had to wait. It was my experiment, it was my like lab experiments and, and things like that. And maybe I had to like rework a group meeting or something like that. But um, I had a very flexible work schedule. <clears throat> and I'm gonna say that I had a better support network when I was in graduate school. Um, my graduate school friends, of course, because I was the only person in the whole department that had a baby, were doting on him all the time, <clears throat> wanting to babysit, uh, wanted to help. Um, <clears throat> and that was kind of a unique thing for me when I was a student. <clears throat> By the time I had my second child and I was in my what I consider mid career, I had much better leave. I had, uh, you know, your 12 week, week maternity leave. I had better health care policies. Um, better nursing conditions. I had, uh, you know, lack, better lactation availability than I did when I was a student that I had to, I had to pump in the bathroom stall, which sucked. <laughs> um, but as uh, you advance in your career, I feel like it gets less flexible. And what I mean by flexible is not like picking your work hours that you want to work certain hours. Flexible means how quickly can you dump your day when the daycare calls and says that your kid fell out of the playground and broke their arm and you need to go take them to the emergency room, even though in five minutes you have a meeting uh, with the uh, vice president of research at the university. <laughs> and so those are like actual real challenges that that happen. Um, so as my career advanced, I became less and less flexible. And so events like that became more and more stressful. Uh, you know, where I lived, uh, we didn't have family. And so if there was something where one of our children got sick and couldn't go to school or couldn't go to daycare or they needed to go to the emergency room, because I have four boys. And so we were in the emergency room all the time um, that as I got on in my career, it was harder and harder to navigate that because the demands that were expected of me as being an advanced professor um, grew. And then obviously, as your career grows, there's more travel and that has uh, uh, challenges all the way. Later, uh, when I in 2008, when I had my third and I was um, I was I was pretty high up at Ohio State there. Uh, again, uh, the flexibility got really, really challenging. Um, my husband and I would have really difficult times trying to figure out how we were going to manage the uh, upturned apple cart of the day. Uh, you have your day plan and then your kid has 105 degree fever and you got to figure it out. Um, and so we would have like, no, my meeting is more important than your meeting uh, kind of arguments, which we just had to, we had to figure it out. But uh, that definitely was way harder than when I was early in my career. I always say like the more important you get, the, the harder it is. So have your children young when uh, when you uh, you can kind of do your own thing. Um, <clears throat> 
later in my career, I definitely had the best maternity leave time, but it was the worst maternity leave because I had to work. Um, you can't replace a temporary uh, replacement for a PI or a director. And so for my third baby, even though I had the longest time, I worked all the time. I felt like I had the least amount of time with him compared to my other children because I was doing emails. I was doing, um, even in 2008, I was doing remote meetings. I'd have to come in, I'd, um, <clears throat> even when I was on maternity leave and, uh, and still work. So that was hard. And then um, next, I want to talk about the age of children. I feel like uh, I am very excited to be able to be here today because my oldest is 24 and my youngest is 13. And so um, I definitely have been through the, the trenches all the way. And I can see that the difference between babies and adolescents do for your career as you're working through. They're two completely different challenges. Babies, while they are exhausting and chaotic because they get sick and, uh, you know, see so the daycare calls and you got to come get them or, or things like that. But actually life with a baby is fairly simple and a daily routine. They get up in the morning, you take them to daycare or the nanny or whatever, and you go to work and then you come home and you have dinner and you play and you go to bed. Adolescents, um, are much more demanding on your time for both emotional and driving support. Driving mean like they need to go to the mall, they need to go to baseball practice, they need to go to a wrestling tournament. <clears throat> and so the time that uh, the adolescents need of you are much more needy than I felt like with my younger children. When you have to go through peer pressure issues, puberty, um, I had two of my sons play really high level hockey that we went out of town every weekend for. Sometimes we would have to drive eight hours, so I'd have to leave Thursday after work. We were gone all day Friday for these hockey tournaments and things like that. Um, then, especially when they're teenagers trying to keep up with their friends, making sure that they're not getting into nefarious activities. And so I really felt like that stage of being a mother and a career was much harder because they needed you there. And one example that I have is that I was at a Hoopo meeting in Seattle. And at the time I was in Ohio <clears throat> and my son's hockey team made it to the, uh, to the state championship game, they won. And there was no way that I was gonna miss that. And so I had to catch a plane from Seattle to, uh, to Ohio. And I had arranged it, and this was unexpected. I didn't expect that this team was gonna make the championship, but I was not gonna miss this for my son. He needed me there. And um, so I had arranged my flight that if everything went perfect, everything had to go perfect. I had to make every flight. There couldn't be any delay. There couldn't be any cancellations that I was gonna make it to the game. And I did, I got to the game just as they were dropping the puck. But since then, it's like I made a deal with the devil. Not a single one of my flights are on time. They're all canceled. I can't get to where I'm going. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so that <clears throat> I, I definitely uh, paid for that. But I made it to that game and I saw him win, uh, get the uh, game winning goal. And, and I, I will never regret doing that. But I left the meeting in the middle of the meeting. The meeting wasn't done. I just packed up and I was like, my son needs me. I'm going to his game. Anyway. Speaking, so then travel. Travel as a career challenge to me is the number one challenge um, in meeting, balancing family and um, your scientific career. Actually, when my children were little, I, I traveled quite frequently because again, it was kind of easy. They were, they had a simple routine. They didn't have gymnastic practice. They didn't have piano practice. You just could, you know, figure it out. And as my kids got older, I've had to step back. So I used to go to many meetings a month. And um, when my kids were in their adolescence, I stepped back to try and maybe only to go into one or two meetings a year. Every year I go to ASMS and sometimes I go to an, opt an optometry meeting because that's what my personal research is in. But I feel like 100% reducing my travel has been a negative impact on my career because I don't get to um, see people and, uh, you know, um, see talks and see my talks, like, or like present my work. And so I feel like that has suffered a little bit, but it, it to be fair, it is my choice 
that I step back um, and uh, lots of people, uh, you know, take a different path than me and that's fine. So what works and what doesn't work? Um, to be successful, you have to have a supportive partner, supportive family, neighbors, colleagues, whoever, you need to find someone that is gonna support you. And one thing that my biggest advice is you have to be positive and firm, not apologetic on your work life balance leave. If you need to three to leave at three o'clock because you need to do something with your children, you leave and everybody gets used to it. Um, they might complain, but then you can say, well, I am available at 7 a.m. if you really need to meet and somehow they get over it. And I think people are, uh, I don't wanna say ashamed, but, um, but apologetic and uh, if you're firm on what you need to do and if you get your work done while you're at work and uh, then they come around they really do and then my next thing is to is I try to keep my work at work and my home at home as much as possible so as I leave work and I'm walking out the door and there's people chasing me down the hall with questions I'm trying to reset myself to like what am I going to make for dinner? What do I need to do to get my kids to their sports practice or their piano lessons? And what are we going to do, you know, for weekend and things like that? I really try to keep them separate. But when I'm at work, I work. And I think the first speaker talked about being more productive after she had children. I can 100% say that I have the same experience with that. When I was in graduate school, I wouldn't say I was lazy, but I was really uh, inefficient. And when I had my baby, when I was in graduate school, I wanted to get my work done so that when I went home, I could be home with the baby and I became very efficient. And you need a supportive partner, a supportive family and supportive neighbors. You can't do this by yourself. And it's the same bullet as the, as the first, this is really, really critical. Um, a, a supportive husband or partner, um, and neighbors, family, you really, that is so important in raising a happy family. And the last thing is you are the most important person. Your kids grow up. I, my two oldest are 24 and my next one is 20 and they live 8,000 miles away. I never get to see them anymore. And so now it's just me and my husband. And while well, I still have my 13 year old and uh, I'm so glad I do, but you are the most important. So you need to find something that you like to do and do it. And so these pictures here, me and my husband, I'm an avid gardener. I love to garden and, um, and take care of my flowers. I have 13 chickens. I'm kind of a, a farmer girl like that. And it gives me much joy to have it, but I've always done it. Even when I was in the throes of having four boys, I still had even a teeny tiny garden and some flowers because I enjoy it. And so here is my last slide. And this is a combination of my family, both at home and at work, doing the things that I love to do. I love my children and I love doing science and I love being a professor. So that is all I have to say. Thank you so much, Carrie. What a great uh, <laughs> final talk, giving, summarizing the whole journey with the young to, uh, you know, grown up kids. And um, is there any question for Carrie? Um, because we're running out of time and extended. Anyone from the audience? Um, I want to ask Kerry, what, you gave a really good, a really good point, balancing and prioritizing, you know, I, I like most important person is you as, uh, because you need to look after yourself more than, and while balancing the yeah, kids growing and I have uh, my boy, my son is 26 years old and I know the journey very well, <laughs> how it's going and emotionally draining sometimes supporting, but as a mother, you can't give up. That's the biggest project you carry in your whole life. And uh, it's it's the most rewarding project too. Um, so I'd like to hear from anyone, um, um, Erin, um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much for all the presenters, Val, Sarah, Catherine, and Kerry. What a wonderful talks and so many important points we can move on. 
uh, we can plan more other things to help mothers and support their career to achieve their best. Um, wishing you all the best. Erin, to you. Thanks, Tusi. And like she said, everybody give a big virtual round of applause for the panelists and for Tusi for organizing this. I think the advice was so good. There were times where I couldn't even think of questions because it's like, oh man, it, 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 so many good points that we didn't hear before. But um, tons of stuff going on in the chat. So I'll save the chat too. And pro um, anybody that wants the chat, email me and I'll send you a copy of the chat because I think there was a lot of good advice that was going on during the talks too. So then we'll have the recording that'll be posted on Twitter. And then anybody that wants the chat, just let me know. Uh, I think that's a great place to end our main session. So anybody that has time to stick around from some networking to meet some people, we'll break into groups after this. And if you have to go, no big deal. We, we realize time prioritization is very important, but it's always fun to be on here and meet people from China, Australia, all over the world, because this is one of the best venues, I think, to do that. And then maybe you want to chat more about what you've heard today, because and it, stay on as long as you would like. I'll just leave this running and I'll stop the recording so that it's not on the recording. But um, I've had some people stay on their group kept going for an hour. So if you guys are getting a good group and you want to keep talking and feel free to keep talking. Um, I'm not sure what we're doing next month yet. <laughs> uh, things have been a little crazy. So we'll get that information out on um, Twitter as soon as we figure it out. But thank you all so much for joining. Let me get pause this.